Doorstep by Keith Lorma Originally published in Galaxy Magazine, February 1961 Narrated by Tom Trussell Steadying his elbow on the kitchen table serving as desk, Brigadier General Straught levelled his binoculars and stared out through the second floor window of the farmhouse at the bulky object lying canted at the edge of the wood lot. He watched the figures moving over and around the grey mass, then flipped the lever on the field telephone at his elbow. How are your boys doing, Major? General, since that box hit this morning. I know all about the box, Bill. So does Washington by now. What have you got that's new? Sir, I haven't got anything to report yet. I have four crews on it, and she still looks impervious as hell. Still getting the sounds from inside? Intermittently, General. I'm giving you one more hour, Major. I want that thing cracked. The General dropped the phone back on its cradle and peeled the cellophane from his cigar absently. He had moved fast, he reflected, after the State Police notified him at 9.41 last night. He had his men on the spot, the area evacuated of civilians, and a preliminary report on its way to Washington by midnight. At 2.36, they had discovered the four-inch cube lying on the ground fifteen feet from the huge object, missile, capsule, bomb, whatever it was. But now, several hours later, nothing new. The field phone jangled. Straught grabbed it up. General, we've discovered a thin spot up on the top side. All we can tell so far is that the wall thickness falls off there. All right, keep after it, Bill. This was more like it. If Brigadier General Straught could have his thing wrapped up by the time Washington awoke to the fact that it was something big, well, he'd been waiting a long time for that second star. This was his chance, and it would damn well make most of it. He looked across the field at the thing. It was half in and half out of the woods, flat-sided, round-ended, featureless. Maybe he should go over and give it a closer look personally. He might spot something the others were missing. It might blow them all to kingdom come any second. But what the hell, he had earned his star and sheer guts in Normandy. He still had them. He keyed the phone. I'm coming down, Bill, he told the Major. On impulse he strapped a pistol belt on. Not much use against a house-sized bomb, but the heft of it felt good. The thing looked bigger than ever as the jeep approached it bumping across the muck of the freshly ploughed field. From here he could see a faint line running around, just below the juncture of side and top. Major Greer hadn't mentioned that. The line was quite obvious. In fact, it was more of a crack. With a sound like a baseball smacking the catcher's glove, the crack opened, the upper half tilted, men sliding, then impossibly it stood open, vibrating like the roof of a house suddenly lifted. The driver gunned the jeep. There were cries and a ragged shrilling that set Straut's teeth on edge. The men were running back now, two of them dragging a third. Major Greer emerged from behind the object, looked about, ran toward General Strout, shouting, A man dead! It snapped! We weren't expecting it! Strout jumped out beside the men, who had stopped now, and were looking back. The underside of the gaping lid was an iridescent black. The shrill noise sounded thinly across the field. Greer arrived, panting. "'What happened?' Straut snapped. "'I was checking over that thin spot, General. The first thing I knew it was coming up under me. I fell. Tate was at the other side. He held on it, and it snapped him loose against a tree. His skull. "'What the devil's that racket?' That's the sound we were getting from inside before, General. There's something in there, alive. All right, pull yourself together, Major. We're not unprepared. Bring a half-tracks into position. The tanks will be here soon. Straut glanced at the men standing about. He would show them what leadership meant. You men keep back, he said. He puffed his cigar calmly as he walked toward the looming object. The noise stopped suddenly. That was a relief. There was a faint and curious odour in the air, something like chlorine, or seaweed, or iodine. 
there were no marks in the ground surrounding the thing. It had apparently dropped straight into its present position. It was heavy, too. The soft soil was displaced in a mound a foot high all along the side. Behind him, Straught heard a yell. He whirled. The men were pointing. The jeep started up, churned toward him, wheels spinning. He looked up. Over the edge of the grey wall, six feet above his head, a great reddish limb, like the claw of a crab, moved, groping. Straught yanked the forty-five from its holster, jacked the action and fired. Soft matter spattered, and the claw jerked back. The screeching started up again angrily, and was drowned in the engine roar as the jeep slid to a stop. Straught stooped, grabbed up a leaf to which a quivering lump adhered, jumped into the vehicle as it leapt forward, and a shock, and they were going into a spin, and... Lucky it was soft ground, somebody said. And somebody else asked, what about the driver? Silence. Straught opened his eyes. What about... A stranger was looking down at him, an ordinary-looking fellow of about thirty-five. Easy now, General Straught. You've had a bad spill. Everything is all right. I'm Professor Lieberman from the university. The driver, Straught said with an effort. He was killed when the jeep went over. Went over? The creature lashed out with a member resembling a scorpion stinger. It struck the jeep and flipped it. You were thrown clear. The driver jumped and the jeep rolled on him. Straught pushed himself up. Where's Greer? I'm right here, sir. Major Greer stepped up, stood attentively. Those tanks here yet? No, sir. I had a call from General Margrave. There's some sort of hold-up. Something about not destroying scientific material. I did get the mortars over from the base. Straught got to his feet. The stranger took his arm. You ought to lie down, General. Who the hell is going to make me? Greer, get those mortars in place, spaced between your tracks. The telephone rang. Straught seized it. General Straught. General Margrave here, Straught. I'm glad you're back on your feet. There'll be some scientists from the State University coming over. Cooperate with them. You're going to have to hold things together at least until I can get another man in there to... Another man? General Margrave, I'm not incapacitated. The situation is under complete control. It is, is it? I understand you've got still another casualty. What happened to your defensive capabilities? That was an accident, sir. The jeep. We'll review that matter at a later date. What I'm calling about is more important right now. The codemen have made some headway on that box of yours. It's putting out a sort of transmission. What kind, sir? Half the message. It's only twenty seconds long. Repeated. It's in English. It's a fragment of a recording from a daytime radio programme. One of the network men I had identified it. The rest is gibberish. They're still working over it. What? Bryant tells me he thinks there may be some sort of correspondence between the two parts of the message. I wouldn't know myself. In my opinion, it's a threat of some sort. I agree, General. An ultimatum. Right. Keep your men back at a safe distance from now on. I want no more casualties. Strout cursed his luck as he hung up the phone. Margrave was ready to relieve him, after he had exercised every precaution. He had to do something fast before this opportunity for a promotion slipped out of his hands. He looked at Major Greer. I'm neutralising this thing once and for all. There'll be no more men killed. Lieberman stood up. General, I must protest any attack against this. Straught whirled. I'm handling this, Professor. I don't know who let you in here or why, but I'll make the decisions. I'm stopping this man-killer before it comes out of its nest, maybe gets into that village beyond the woods. There are four thousand civilians there. It's my job to protect them. He jerked his head at Greer, strode out of the room. Lieberman followed, pleading. The creatures show no signs of aggressiveness, General Strott. With two men dead? You should have kept them back. Oh, it was my fault, was it? Strott stared at Lieberman with cold fury. This civilian pushed his way in here, then had the infernal gall to accuse him, Brigadier General Straught, of causing the death of his own men. If he had had the fellow in uniform for five minutes. You're not well, General. That fall. Keep out of my way, Professor, Straught said. He turned and went on down the stairs. 
the present foul-up could ruin his career, and now this egghead interference. With Greer at his side, Strott moved out to the edge of the field. All right, Major, open up with your fifty calibers. Greer called a command, and the staccato rattle started up. The smell of cordite and the blue haze of gun smoke. This was more like it. He was in command here. Lieberman came up to Strott. "'General, I appeal to you in the name of science. Hold off a little longer, at least until we learn what the message is about.' "'Get back from the firing line, Professor.' Strott turned his back on the civilian, raised their glasses to observe the effect of the recoilless rifle. There was a tremendous smack of displaced air, and a thunderous boom as the explosive shell struck. Strott saw the grey-shaped jump, the raised-lived waver. Dust rose from about it. There was no other effect. "'Keep firing, Greer,' Strott snapped, almost with a feeling of triumph. The thing was impervious to artillery. Now who was going to say it was no threat? "'How about the mortar, sir?' Greer said. "'We can drop a few rounds right inside it.' "'All right, try that before the lid drops.' "'And what'll we try next? I don't know,' he thought." The mortar fired with a muffled thud. Strott watched tensely. Five seconds later, the object erupted in a gout of pale pink debris. The lid rocked, pinkish fluid running down its opalescent surface. A second burst, and a third. A great fragment of the menacing claw hung from the branch of a tree a hundred feet from the ship. Strott grabbed up the phone. Cease fire! Lieberman stared in horror at the carnage. The telephone rang. Strott picked it up. "'General Strott,' he said. His voice was firm. He had put an end to the threat. "'Strott, we've broken the message,' General Margrave said excitedly. "'It's the damnedest thing I ever—' Strott wanted to interrupt, announce his victory, but Margrave was droning on. Strange sort of reasoning, but there was a certain analogy— in any event, I am assured the translation is accurate. Here's how it reads in English. Strott listened, and he carefully placed the receiver back on the hook. Lieberman stared at him. What did it say? Strott cleared his throat. He turned and looked at Lieberman for a long moment before answering. It said, Please take good care of my little girl.'